I praise God for the time that he has given us this morning to sit in his presence and uh, study <coughs> from his uh, word. Uh, it's after a long time that I'm visiting this assembly again. Uh, during the COVID time, we were all separated in our own areas, but I'm glad that at least some freedom is now available for us to move around and go to different assemblies, uh, which is really good. And uh, this morning I enjoyed the fellowship with, with you all and uh, also enjoyed breaking bread and remembering our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now, as many of you know that uh, I'm a teacher and uh, right now we are enjoying our summer vacation but soon we'll go back to the classrooms in September and then life will be busy again. But right now, uh, we are enjoying. My wife is also a teacher. We were able to take a vacation for three, three weeks in India recently and we enjoyed the time with our parents and siblings and now we are back here. Um, so that's how life is going on. Uh, my daughter is working in Burlington. My son has recently graduated uh, from Ryerson University looking for a job. So that's how our family uh, background is. Uh, please remember us in your prayers whenever you think of us. Uh, we will be also remembering you praying for this assembly so that God may bless everybody here and uh, God may strengthen everybody in faith in the coming days. <clears throat> this morning, so I want to come to the uh, topic straight. This morning, I want to share with you a rather unusual topic, or maybe a little difficult topic for some people, but if you pay attention, you'll be able to understand. The, the title is, Is There Any Objective Evidence for the Message of Christianity? So let me repeat again. Is there any objective evidence evidence for the message of Christianity. First, we need to determine what is the message of Christianity. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3, the message of Christianity is very beautifully summarized. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse, verse 3. So we will understand what that message is and then we will see whether we have any objective evidence to believe in that message. So the message is 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 3 says, I'm reading from New King James Version. Paul says this, for I deliver to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So this is the the message of Christianity. Christ died for our sins. Now we all believe in this message and actually belief is all that, that is needed. We, we are not required to understand this message logically or very systematically. Nowhere the Bible says that. Everywhere the Bible says that believe in this message and you will be saved. So all we need is believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins. The fundamental message of Christianity, Christ died for our sins. All we need to do is just believe in it. If you don't understand it, that's okay. The, the Bible doesn't ask everybody to understand it logically or deeply. Believe in it, that Christ died for your sins and you will be saved. That was the preaching of the, the disciples, preaching of the apostles and preaching of the Christians throughout the centuries that believe that Christ died for your sins. Those who believed, they have the assurance that their sins are forgiven and they will be in heaven with God. But we need to understand this message deeply if people ask us questions about it. If somebody asks, asks us to explain this message, then mere belief would not be enough. We cannot just tell them, oh, I just believe it. You just believe too. If somebody is asking us logical questions about 
the message of Christianity, then we need something beyond our belief. We need some systematic way to present our belief or even sometimes some evidence to support our belief. And actually the Bible says that, the Bible recommends it. Let me read from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. So if people ask you to give a reason, some evidence, then we must be prepared. That's what the Bible says, right? So it's always good to check if there are some objective proofs for our belief. Now, what, what do I mean by objective proof? We all have our own reasons to believe in the message of Christianity, our personal reasons. For some reasons, we all were convinced that this message is true. That is called subjective evidence. We all have our own subjective evidence. But when we need to talk about something beyond subjective evidence, that becomes objective evidence. And objective evidence is the same for everyone. And that is something that nobody can deny. So the question is, do we have objective proofs for the message of Christianity? Actually, we do. At least five objective proofs are there. I will just read through them. You don't need to memorize them, don't need to remember them. But the first one is the most important on which I'm going to, um, to talk about today, the first one. So you need to remember only the first one. The rest of them, uh, even if you forget, that's fine. But let me quickly read through all those five of them, at least five. There might be more, but at least five evidences to prove that the message of Christianity is true, that Christ died for our sins. The first proof is, the message of Christianity can be logically proven to be based on God's revelation. Let me repeat again. The message of Christianity can be logically proven to be based on God's revelation. If we are able to prove this, then we don't need any, any more proofs, right? If we are able to show people that what we believe is based on God's revelation, we do not, do not need any further proofs. Certainly we do not, because if we have received it from God, if we are able to prove it, that's all we need, right? So that's the first uh, proof we, on which I'm going to talk about today. But uh, the rest of the proofs are this. Number two, the death of Jesus Christ can be logically justified as the only way that meets our greatest need in the afterlife. What is our greatest need in the afterlife? Receiving forgiveness for our sins. The death of the Jesus Christ is the only way which, which can be logically justified as a way which can meet our greatest need in the afterlife. No other religions, um, no other uh, ideologies or teachings of religions will stand the scrutiny of, um, of logic. Number three. The lives and the deaths of the disciples of Jesus prove that Christianity was not invented by them. Thus, Christianity requires a divine originator. So that was the third one. Let me repeat again. The lives and the deaths of the disciples of Jesus prove that Christianity was not invented by them. Thus, Christianity requires a divine originator. Number four. Historical and logical proofs for the death and the resurrection of Jesus prove that the fundamental claims of Christianity are built on real historical events. One more time, number four. Historical and logical proofs for the death and the resurrection of Jesus prove that the fundamental claims of Christianity are built on real historical events. Number five, the last one. The uniqueness of the message of Christianity and the founder of Christianity proves that Christianity is different from all other religions, which in turn proves the divine origin of Christianity. So the uniqueness of the message of Christianity and the uniqueness of the founder of Christianity proves 
that Christianity is different from all other religions, which in turn proves the divine origin of Christianity. So these are the five objective proofs that we can give for Christianity, but this requires a lot of studies. I'm not asking anybody to spend a lot of time on that, but let's focus on the first one, which is the most important. The rest of them you can for forget for now. But the first one was that, that cr the message of Christianity can be logically proven to be based on God's revelation. When we say this to other people, people of other religions might also say, oh, what are you talking about? Our religion is also based on God's revelation. People might make that claim, right? But the truth is this. The, though people might make such claim, but they cannot prove it. But Christians can prove logically that our message is truly based on God's revelation. So I'm going to show you how you prove it. So probably you got the idea of what I'm going to talk about, right? When you tell others that the message of Christianity is based on, truly based on God's revelation, other people might object. They might say, okay, our religion is also based on God's revelation, but that cannot be proven. They can make such claims, but we Christians can actually prove it. So I'm going to show you how you prove it to other friends, your colleagues, um, how you tell them that the message of Christianity is truly based on God's revelation. Now, if you don't want to prove to others, still it is good to know at least for your own conviction, right? Sometimes we, we may have our own doubts, but when we understand that what we have believed is truly based on God's revelation, uh, it, is, it would be very easy for us to, to convince ourselves that what we have believed is the ultimate truth and the only truth that can take us to God. Okay, so how, how do we prove it? We need to go through a few questions. So I'm gonna uh, present those questions and I'm going to give you the answer. The first question, why is God's revelation important? Why is God's revelation? Why am I saying that the message of Christianity is based on God's revelation? Why is God's revelation important? Here is the answer. Humans cannot understand God with their own logic. If we could understand God with our own logic, all religions in the world would have agreed on who God is. But since the, the, the religions of this world do not agree on who God is, it is clear that we cannot understand God with our human wisdom and logic. Then you might ask, uh, then how do we know God? How do we understand God? There is only one way, through his revelation. That is, only if God chooses to reveal himself to humans. Only if God chooses to reveal himself to humans. There is no other way to, God, to know God. We can never know God with our human wisdom. If we could know that, we all would have agreed on who God is, right? So the revelation of God is the only way through which we can understand God. So what does that mean? That means you need to start looking for the revelation of God in various religious books, because all those religious books claim that they have the revelation of God, right? And when we study a subject, normally what do we do? We start from the first chapter. If you are given a textbook on any subject, biology or chemistry, you won't start from the middle of the book. You will start from the beginning of the book. Similarly, likewise, if you want to study the, the revelations of God, you need to start from the earliest revelation of God, okay? So that leads us to the second question, where would you find the earliest revelation of God? So what was my first question? Why is God's revelation important? The answer is, it is important because there is no other way to know God. Second question, where would you find God's earliest revelation? Okay, this question is very important, right? Because all books claim that they have uh, God's revelation, but where would you find God's earliest revelation? Now, logically speaking, God's earliest revelation must have been given to a person whom God created first, right? That's logical to think. We cannot think that God created a, a human and just left him in the darkness without giving him any revelation. That's not logical to think. So we must think, we must come to the conclusion that God created the first human and God gave him his revelation. 
So the earliest revelation must have been given to the first human whom God created. Right? That's logical. We all agree. Anybody will agree on that. The second thing which is logical also is this, that if that earliest revelation is recorded in any book in this world, that book must be a book from one of the ancient religions. Because we cannot uh, believe that God will wait till 2022 to reveal his earliest revelation, right? If God has revealed that to anybody, that must be in one of the books of the ancient revelation, ancient religions. So when you look, go through the ancient religions, you will see that there are eight major ancient religions. Eight major ancient religions. So at least we should start looking into their scriptures to see where we find God's earliest revelation. So what are those eight ancient religions? Hinduism, Judaism, Jainism, Buddhism, uh, Confucianism, so, so on. There are eight main uh, ancient religions. When you go through the scriptures of all those religions, surprisingly you will see that the earliest revelation of God is only in one book. Only one book in the world. And that book is the Torah of Judaism. The Torah of Judaism is the only book in the ancient religions which gives us the story of the first human that God created or the first couple whom God created and the revelations that God gave to them. So the Torah is the only book in the world which contains God's earliest revelation. Now, you know that this Torah was later included in the Bible. Now, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, those five books written by Moses, those are called those are known uh, as the Torah. So Torah is the only book that contains the earliest revelation of God, and now the Torah is in the Bible. Therefore, Bible is the only book in the world. The Bible is the only book in the world that contains God's earliest revelation. Okay. Now, so we'll come to the next question. The next question is, how do we know that what is recorded in the Torah or in the Bible or in the first three chapters of Genesis as the earliest revelation of God is truly from God? How do we know that? Isn't it possible that probably Moses made up that story? Do we have any evidence to believe that that earliest revelation is truly from God? Yes, we do. There are two exceptional facts in the earliest revelation of God in the first three chapters of Genesis, which a Jewish writer could not have written. Moses could not have written or he could not have made that up because Jews don't believe in those doctrines. Two exceptional facts, two exceptional doctrines, which I'm going to tell you, that will convince you that the earliest revelation which is recorded in the Torah is truly from God. It is not made up by a Jewish writer or by Moses. Now, what are those two exceptional facts? The first is the plurality of God, and the second is the concept of a substitute. Now, let's look at the plurality of God. Now, you know that Mo the Jews strictly believe in the singularity of God. They believe that God is just one person. God is one, but one person, right? They don't believe that there are more persons in one God. So it is not possible that Moses would have made something up of that sort. But when we look into the earliest revelation of God, we see that God is revealed as one God, but with plurality. I'll, I'll, gi I'll give you two references. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. You know where, the, um, where Adam and Eve were, uh, the, the, the people, the, the humans were being made. God said this. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. God said, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Our, look at the pronoun that God is using, the plural pronoun. Our image, let us make, us, our image, our likeness. And the interesting thing is, though the, pl the pronoun is plural, but the verb is singular in Hebrew. 
you know, let us make, make, make. That word is singular, which shows that there is only one God, but there are more than one persons in that one God, right? The plurality is very clear here. Now, some people might say, those who object um, the plurality, object to the plurality of God, they would say, no, no, this could be the royal plurality. You know, in the olden days, kings used to refer to them in royal uh, usages. They would say, we give this order, or, um, or this is our order, something like that. So probably God is using such language. But that's not true. If you come to the next reference, which is Genesis chapter 3, verse 22, there you would see that God is not referring to royal plurality. He is referring to actual plurality. How do we know that? Genesis 3, verse 22, I'm reading this. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. After Adam fell into sin, Adam and Eve, God said, the man has become like one of us. Could that be a royal plurality? No. That cannot be. One of us, no king would say that uh, one of us is ordering this, right? No. Uh, so this is not royal plurality, or this say, shows that there is more than one person in one God. And you know, the very first verse in the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God, the word used there is Elohim, which is a plural word. Actually, that could have been translated as in the beginning, God's created the heavens and the earth. But why didn't the Bible scholars translate it that way? Because the verb used there is singular. In the beginning, God created, created, bara. That word is singular. So there is a real dilemma. P the persons are plural, but the verb are singular. So Elohim is a shows the plurality of God. There are so many verses in the Old Testament that shows the plurality of God. But what I'm trying to say is, in the earliest revelation of God, God revealed himself as one God with plurality of person. This could not have been made up by a Jew. This must be a revelation from God. Okay, so that's one exceptional, the first exceptional fact. The second ex exceptional fact is the concept of a substitute. Jews don't believe in the concept of a substitute. They don't believe that there is a substitute for humanity. Right? They just believe that they have to um, do the, the sacrifices or pray to Yahweh directly, but they don't believe in any substitute. But in, in um, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, God made a prophecy, which is known as God's first prophecy. In that prophecy, he talks about the offspring of the woman. Offspring means the son, the son of a woman. That offspring of the woman is a substitute. We will understand that how, how that is. So there is a concept of a substitute in the earliest revelation of God, which again, Moses could not have made up. So, so what I'm trying to say here is we have two exceptional facts in the earliest revelation of God to prove that what is claimed as the earliest revelation of God in the Torah is actually from God. It was not made up by Moses or made up by any Jewish writer because they don't believe in those doctrines. So this tells us that the, what is recorded in the Torah as the earliest revelation of God is truly from God. Now, the next question, but why is this earliest revelation of God recorded only in a Jewish scripture? Why not in a Hindu scripture or a Buddhist scripture or in any other? So why only a Jewish scripture? The reason is this. In the earliest revelation of God, there is the first prophecy of God. And in the first prophecy of God, there is a promise about the offspring of the woman. This offspring of the woman was going to be born as a Jew. Okay, the offspring of the woman, we know who, who he is. He's G, it is Jesus Christ, right? He was going to be born as a Jew. And that's the reason why God revealed this earliest revelation to a Jewish prophet. And he wrote that in, in the Torah, and later that became part of their Bible, or the Tanakh, or the Old Testament. 
So this is the reason why the earliest revelation of God is found only in the Jewish scripture and in the Torah. In all the religious books of the world, it is only the Torah that has the earliest revelation of God, and we know why. Okay, now we come to our final question, and that is, but how do we prove, how do we prove that the, early, the, that the message of Christianity is based on God's revelation? Now we know that God's revelation, earliest revelation, at least the earliest revelation, is only in the Torah, in no other book in the world. But how do we prove that the message of Christianity is based on God's revelation or God's earliest revelation. So this is how we prove it. Now, as I mentioned to you, that in the earliest revelation of God is found the first prophecy of God. And that first prophecy of God, in the first prophecy of God, there are five predictions made about a person. All those five predictions were fulfilled by Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ was born into this world, all the five predictions made in the first prophecy of God were fulfilled by Jesus Christ. So what does that mean? That means that the death of Jesus Christ or the mission of Jesus Christ was not an accident. That was something which God had declared from the very beginning of human history. Think of that. Our first forefathers, Adam and Eve, in their presence, God made the promise of a substitute, uh, the, the offspring of the woman. And that five predictions in that prophecy were all fulfilled by Jesus Christ, by nobody else. Thus we can prove that the message of Christianity is based on God's revelation, or God's earliest revelation. There is no religion in, the, in this world whose followers can claim that their message can be proven this way. No religion. Take any religion, no religion. So it is only Christianity, the message of Christianity that can be proven this way. So I'm going to lead you to that first prophecy of God and show you how there are five predictions in that first prophecy and how they were all fulfilled by God. Thus we will be convinced that what we believe is the truth, the truth that God had declared from the very beginning of human history. So what was the first prophecy? In, in uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, if you read the first prophecy, uh, it is a little complicated, but I'm just giving you the paraphrased version, the paraphrase, the summary. The summary is this. God said to Satan, now why is God speaking to Satan? Because Satan deceived Adam and Eve. Now, now we know the that the story of Adam and Eve, which is in the earliest revelation of God, is not a myth. It was revealed by God, right? Why, how do we know that? Because of those two exceptional facts. Because of those two exceptional facts, we know that the story of Adam and Eve is the real beginning of human history. That's how human history started, because it is the revelation of God. Okay, so, Adam and Eve were deceived by Satan. Uh, and God is speaking to Satan now. God is speaking to Satan and saying this, the offspring of the woman will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So just remember these two sentences. The offspring of the woman will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now, how do we know that this prophecy is about Jesus Christ? Or how do we know that there are five predictions in, the, I, I just mentioned two sentences, right? But you'll be surprised to know that there are five predictions in this prophecy which were all fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So let me take you uh, through them one by one. The first, the offspring of the woman is a substitute. How do we know that? If you read the story of Adam and Eve, you will not see the offspring of the woman anywhere in the story until this uh, verse. The offspring of this woman was not deceived. It was Adam and Eve who were deceived. So if anybody had to take up a battle with Satan, Adam and Eve should have done that. Where did the offspring of the woman come from all of a sudden? Why is he there? So that tells us 
that since Adam and Eve cannot take up a battle with Satan, God is sending a substitute. The offspring of the woman is a substitute for Adam and Eve, and not only for Adam and Eve, but for the entire human race. So thus we know that the offspring of the woman is a substitute, the first point, the first prediction. And when you look into the history of the world, you will see that there was only one person who came into this world and claimed that he's a substitute, and that was Jesus Christ. Look at a few statements of Jesus. Once Jesus said this, the Son of Man has not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. That's a statement of a substitute. On another occasion, Jesus Christ said, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. That's again a statement of a substitute. So the Bible presents Jesus Christ as a substitute, and the only person in the history of the world who claimed to be a substitute is Jesus Christ. So thus, the, the, the earliest, the first prophecy of God, where God said that the offspring of the woman will come, that prophecy was uh, fulfilled in Jesus Christ, the substitute. The second prediction there, the second prediction is the offspring of the woman will be born from a virgin. How do you know that? It's not clearly mentioned there, but this is how we know. According to the biblical usage, if a child is referred to, uh, or mentioned, if a child is referred to both man and woman, or a child is coming out of the union of a man and woman, that child would always be referred to as the offspring of the man. That's the biblical usage. See, anywhere, if both man and woman are in the scene, that child will be known as the offspring of the man. Think about this situation. When God is making this prophecy um, to Satan, Adam and Eve both are standing there, both of them. If God is referring to a child which is to be born from the union of both man and woman, God would say the offspring of the man would crush your head. But God said the offspring of the woman, which, prove, which very clearly proves that this substitute was going to be born from a virgin. And you know who that is. In the history of the world, there was only one child who was born from a virgin, and that is Jesus Christ. So this is the second prediction made about the offspring of the woman, which was fulfilled in the life of Jesus Christ. The third prediction is that the offspring of the woman will defeat the authority of Satan. Now, what did Jesus, uh, what did God say? God said the offspring of the woman will crush your head. What does head mean? Head means authority. So this offspring of the woman was supposed to crush the authority of Satan. What was uh, the authority of Satan? Or where did Satan have authority? We see from the Bible that Satan had authority over two areas, over two areas, and Jesus Christ is the only person in the history of the world who crushed Satan in both those areas. So what were those two areas? You know, when you go to um, Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, there God said, uh, do not eat from, the, from this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The day you will eat from it, you will die. Right? So two actions. You eat and you die. Satan made them to eat it. What, so what was that? That was disobedience to God or that was the sin? That was the sin that Satan made them to do. And as a result, they died. So Satan got authority over these two areas, sin and death. Because Satan made them to sin, Satan made them to die. So Satan had authority over these two areas. But God said, the offspring of the woman will crush your authority, crush your head. How did Jesus crush these two areas? Only Jesus did that in the history of the world. First, how did Jesus crush the authority of Satan over sin? By living a sinless life. In the history of the world, only one person who lived a sinless life, Jesus Christ. Only one person made a challenge to his, uh, his opponents that which of you 
convicts me of my sin. In, uh, in John chapter 8, verse 46, no other person in this world ever made such a claim. Which of you convicts me of my sin? He challenged his opponents to show a, a single sin in his life, but there was none. Jesus Christ was a sinless person. By living a sinless person, he crushed the authority of Satan over sin. And then, how did he crush the authority of Satan over death? We know that. We all know that, right? We know that Jesus Christ died on the cross, and on the third day, he rose from the dead. And that's, that's the way he crushed the authority of Satan. So the third prediction was that the offspring of the woman will crush the authority of Satan. And we know that it is only Jesus Christ who crushed the authority of Satan on over two areas. Now the third, fourth prediction is that the offspring of the woman will be killed. Now you may say, where does the text say that? Does the text say that? No, the text doesn't say that, but we come to a conclusion. How do we, how do we come to that conclusion? The prophecy is that the offspring of the woman will crush your head and you will strike his heel. God is saying to Satan, you will strike his heel. Remember, Satan is depicted as a serpent in this context. When a serpent strikes your heel, what happens? What happens? If a poisonous serpent strikes your heel, death. The result is death. So the death of this offspring of the woman is hinted at here. There is an indication of that death. And we know that who fulfilled that prophecy again. In the history of the world, Jesus Christ was the only person who was born to die. We all are born to live, right? We want to live. No, none of us want to die before time. We all want to live. But Jesus Christ came into this world to die. Many times he made that prediction that I have come to die, right? So. The fourth prediction is that the offspring of the woman will be killed. The fifth prediction is that the offspring of the woman will be a divine person. How do we know that? Does the text say that? No, it doesn't, but we can come to that conclusion. This is how. If Adam and Eve were able to defeat Satan, there would not have been a need of, um, of, of a substitute, right? But why were Adam and Eve not able to defeat Satan? Because they were humans. Being humans, they were not able to fight, take a battle with Satan and defeat him. So it required a divine person to defeat Satan. And thus, we come to the conclusion that offspring of the woman must be a divine person. And when we come to the New Testament, we see that. The only divine person who was ever born into this world was Jesus Christ. We read from uh, John chapter 1, verse 1, that in the beginning there was word, and word was with God, and word was God. And then in verse 14, we read that the word took flesh. The word became flesh and lived among us. So Jesus Christ was divine. He was God himself, the second person in the Trinity. Now, you remember I, I referred to you about the plurality of God in the earliest revelation of God. In the Old Testament, um, it is not mentioned how many persons in that plurality. But when we come to the New Testament, Jesus Christ revealed how many persons there. He's, when he was talking about the, the baptism, he said, baptize the disciples into, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So there, Jesus Christ revealed that in the plurality of God, there are three persons. So now we know that the one true God is the triune God. In, 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 the, plura, in the trinity of this, this God, the second person, Jesus Christ, became human. And that's how Jesus Christ is divine. He was God himself, the second person in the trinity. So, so, so now we saw the, the five predictions about the offspring of the woman, and you see that it was all fulfilled by Jesus Christ. Five predictions. The first one, he would be a substitute. The second one, he would be born from a virgin. Third, he would defeat the authority of Satan. Fourth, he will be killed. And fifth, he will be a divine person. 
Look at who fulfilled all these prophecies, all this prediction, only Jesus Christ. Thus we prove, thus we come to the conclusion that the message of Christianity, that Jesus died for our sins, is based on God's revelation. Not on just any revelation, God's very earliest revelation. Starting from the very earliest revelation, it is proven. But did God stop there? No. He gave subsequent revelations, follow-up revelations, to confirm this message. Um, so God did not stop there after giving this first prophecy. He kept sending more revelation through the subsequent prophets. And those revelations were also given to only Jewish prophets, not to the prophets or leaders of any other religion, only Jewish prophets. Why? Because the offspring of the woman was going to be born as a Jew. So he kept giving those prophecies to Jewish prophets only, and that is why all these prophecies about a promised one is only in the Jewish Tanakh or the Old Testament. So if you look through those subsequent prophecies, you will see that very clearly a promised one is depicted there. Um, where he will be born, how he will be born, which tribe he will be born from, what kind of life uh, would be his, and what kind of death he will have. All these predictions were made about, um, about a promised one in the Old Testament. Now, uh, one thing which we all need to know there are two types of prophecies in the Old Testament about this promised one, two types. One is about his suffering and one is about his glory. Now this confused the Jewish people. Very clearly, you know that there are many prophecies which are only about the suffering of the promised one, many prophecies which are about the glory of the promised one. So this might have really confused the Jewish people. And according to human nature, we don't want to look at the suffering and all. We just want to look at the glory. So they just made up their mind that their Messiah could be someone who is glorious. So they could not accept that their Messiah or the promised one could come and suffer. And this is why they crucified the offspring of the woman when he was born. Because they were not ready to accept uh, the, 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 the prophecies made about his suffering. Uh, but Jesus Christ made it very clear that all those prophecies about the promised one in the Old Testament, whether about his suffering or about his glory, they're all about him. I just want to read a few verses from, uh, uh, from Luke chapter 24. Uh, with this, I'll close. This is the last uh, verses. Luke chapter 24, verse 27. This is happening after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. After the resurrection of Jesus Christ, when the disciples are still not ready to believe what has happened, they could not believe that their leader was crucified, their prophet was crucified. They could not believe it. Then Jesus is telling them, Luke chapter 24, verse 27, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he exposed, sorry, he expounded to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So this means that in the Old Testament or in the Jewish Tanakh, all the prophecies about a promised one were about him. Uh, this is again clear from uh, Luke chapter 24, verse 44, the same chapter, verse 44. There it says, then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the laws of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. So see, Jesus Christ covered the whole Old Testament, the entire Tanakh, the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalm. That, uh, that covers the entire Old Testament. So again, Jesus claimed that the promised one mentioned uh, or prophesied in those books are, is him, or all those prophecies are about him, right? But now the question is then, then why don't Jews believe in Jesus? When things are so clear, what's the problem with Jews? 
why don't they accept the claim, why don't they accept Jesus as the Messiah? The answer is very simple. Their objection is that Jesus Christ did not fulfill all the prophecies. Okay, try to understand. As I told you, there are two types of prophecies in the subsequent revelations of God. One is about the suffering of the promised one. One is about the glory of the promised one. They claim that Jesus Christ did not fulfill all prophecies. They are referring to the prophecies about the glory. Prophecies uh, that mentions the glory of the, the promised one. So how can we answer this? We don't need to answer. Jesus Christ himself answered. Jesus Christ himself gave an interpretation about why he fulfilled only the prophecies about the suffering of the, of the promised one. Let's read that from Luke chapter 24, verse 26. Luke 24, verse 26. There Jesus says, did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? See, this interpretation solves all the problem. If Jews ask us, why didn't Jesus fulfill all the prophecies? This is the answer. He said that the Messiah had to suffer first and then enter his glory. He was not going to fulfill both prophecies at the same time. He came to suffer first. He very clearly interpreted or uh, distinguished both prophecies separately, both types of prophecies. The prophecies of the suffering were going to be fulfilled by him in, in his first coming. But the prophecies about his glory is going to be fulfilled in his second coming. So this is how we understand that, the, that Jesus Christ is mentioned or Jesus Christ is referred to in the earliest revelation of God and the subsequent revelation of God. So when we take this earliest revelation of God and the subsequent revelations of God, we know that Jesus Christ is there in the revelation of God. There is no other religion can boast this. No other faith system can boast that their belief is based on God's revelation, only Christianity. So this tells us that the mission of Jesus Christ, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ was not an accident. It was something that God had planned at the very beginning, at the beginning of human history, when there were only two people, our, our first forefathers, Adam and Eve. So the prophecies that were made to them is applicable to everybody because there were only two people at that time. So when, it, when a substitute was promised to them, that means that substitute is promised to all of us. So Jesus Christ is not for only, for only a small group of people. He's for the entire humanity. And we understand that his mission was based on God's revelation. Or the message of Christianity that we believe in is based on God's revelation. And when you look at other religions, no other religions can claim anything like this. So this tells us that what we believe is the only truth. This is the only truth. There is no other truth. This is why the, the disciples of Jesus, apostles of Jesus, are very confident in saying that there is no salvation in, in anyone else. They're very confident because they knew that what Jesus has accomplished was the plan of God. He was the substitute for all of us. So if anyone listening to me has not come to that knowledge that Jesus Christ is the only way, this is the time. You must examine your life and you must submit your life to Jesus Christ because that is the only way prepared by God for the forgiveness of our sins. And there is no other way for anyone to reach God because this, the message of Christianity is based on God's revelation, which means God's earliest revelation and God's subsequent revelations. May God's name be glorified. Let's uh, pray and uh, close. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for um, opening our hearts this morning to understand this divine truth from your word. 
When the message of Christianity was given to us first time, we simply believed it. We did not ask any questions. We did not understand the depth of it. But we believed that Jesus died for our sins. But now we know that this is the only truth. This is the only way to reach God because this was something which was prepared by God from the very beginning of human history. When you, pro pro when you made your first prophecy that the offspring of the woman will crush the the head of Satan, that was a prophecy about Jesus Christ. That was a plan of salvation that you prepared at the very beginning of human history. Thank you, God, for opening our hearts to understand this. Thank you that we were able to believe in it without asking too many questions. Because if we ask too many questions, probably we'll, we, we would not be able to understand everything. But we know that what we have believed is based on God's revelation. That's all we need to understand. We don't need to understand anything else. We have believed what God has revealed to us. So Father, we thank you. Thank you, God, for opening this truth to us. Thank you for opening our, the eyes of our heart so that we can understand, we can see this truth. Uh, God, help us to be strong in our faith in the coming days. Help us to be very, very convinced and firm in our faith so that we can share our uh, share this truth with even our friends our co-workers that this is the only way of God for salvation thank you for saving us thank you for bringing us to this knowledge this is not because of our merit we have done nothing special it was all your grace by grace we are saved we thank you God I pray for this assembly there are so many needs mentioned today for prayers. God, I pray for all those needs. God, have mercy upon the people who are going through health problem or sickness and other difficulties. Have mercy upon them, God. Nothing is impossible with you. You have the solution for every solution. So I pray for every problem. So I pray for this assembly. Have mercy upon everybody here. Help this assembly to grow. In the coming days, help this assembly to be strong in faith and be a light in this area. Uh, thank you, God, for bringing us to here. Thank you for this nice fellowship we had. And now we will be going back to our homes. Keep us safe wherever we are until we meet again. We give you all glory and adoration and worship because you are worthy to receive it. In the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, we pray. Just a short hymn to, uh, to close, number 197, Lamb of Glory, 197. Hear the story from God's word, the kings and priests and prophets heard that there would be a sacrifice and blood would flow to pay sin's price. Precious Lamb of Glory, love's most wondrous story, heart of God, redemption of men. Worship the Lamb of Glory. 197.